group of, of people in the audience, except for my sabbatical at Stanford. I would, without that, I would only know Nelson, I think. So uh, this is a great opportunity for me to meet you, to hear about what you're doing, um, and to offer an economic perspective on land use and leakage. So this is basically what I've learned over the last decade of working in this area from an economic perspective. And I am going to be emphasizing things that I think sometimes are missing in your papers. Um, Patrick was generous to give me um, a zip file of about two dozen papers <laughs> many of you have written, and I've tried to look over those and, and include some of that in this. Um, so that's my objective here this morning. Um, and um, obviously there's a rich literature in this area. Many of you have contributed to this literature. These are some themes that I'm going to touch on this morning. In the context of each of those themes, I'm going to emphasize uh, a core set of economic responses um, that are critical in the land use and leakage debate from an economic perspective. So things like the extensive and intensive margins of supply response, how consumers respond to food prices, the extent of market integration through trade. That's a very important consideration. I'm also going to touch on uh, something near and dear to my heart, and that is general equilibrium considerations. That's something rarely talked about in this context, but it can matter what's happening in the rest of the economy outside of the land using sector, and I want to emphasize that. So I'll do this um, essentially by walking through five successively more complex views of the world. Okay? So we're going to start, about, start out thinking about the world as one large unit, so no trade at this point, because it's um, we're thinking about agriculture as uh, the world agriculture sector. And we'll think about that uh, for a few minutes and make a couple of key points, I think, that are important in the long-term land use change debate. Uh, then we'll get into the trade issue. Um, so we'll separate the treated region. Many of you are talking about you know, um, interventions in one region for conservation or other purposes. Um, and we'll separate that out and think about the treated region and the rest of the world. So that takes us into the world of trade, um, and we'll initially assume trade economist nirvana, what we, I call integrated markets, so everything works perfectly, and then we'll explore the implications uh, when that breaks down, when um, we're in a world of segmented markets. <clears throat> then I'll talk about um, something that Nelson and I have worked on before, and I think it's really important, and that's understanding the geography of world trade. Uh, that that is critical in understanding the pattern of, of land use and leakage that emerges. Um, and finally, I'll talk about some of these general equilibrium considerations. So that's the roadmap. Um, so let's start out. Um, you know, this is a paper I wrote a number of years ago. Some of you have read it. Some of you have seen me present related stuff. But I think it's a good starting point. Um, and I, I'd like to make, you know, uh, out of this one or two points that I think are fundamental and it's easy to lose sight of um, when you're working um, in this area. So this is the the world in which we're just thinking about one global farm and food sector. So it's it's very simple in that regard. Um, I'm going to focus on three drivers of change in this. There's demand growth. You think of population, income, biofuels, and so on. There's the, the productivity growth, or what often is called the trend yield growth. Um, and that is denoted with an L up here, denoted because uh, it affects the demand for land. And then there's the stuff that many of you guys think about, and that's conservation, other things that remove land from agriculture. So that affects the supply of land. So demand for output, demand for land, and supply of land. Those are the things that I'm going to think about in terms of long-run drivers, and there are three margins of response. You often hear economists talk about the price elasticity of demand and the extensive and intensive margins of supply response. So this is how yields change endogenously within the system in response to prices. Uh, this relates to trend changes maybe due to R&D investments 20 years ago that are now emerging in terms of improved productivity. So um, with this framework, you can come up with the following key equation. Uh, if you're talking about land use change at mid-century, percent change from today, how is that determined? How do economic forces play into that? Well, these are the drivers I was talking about. More population, you need more land. Higher yields, you need less land. Okay. Um, 
what is really important is how the economics factor into this, because if, as in many studies, you don't allow for in endogenous response to prices in terms of intensification or demand, these terms disappear, it collapses to a foot race between population and yield, essentially. It's just a simple foot race. Very intuitive here, and this is the way FAO and many others have constructed their long-run projections of land use for a long time. So what are they missing? They're missing the shock absorber here. Okay, Economics provides a shock absorber. Economics um, means that if um, you need more uh, more output. You might some of this might come from higher yields instead of area. So, if you ignore economics, you're going to overstate land use change flat out. That's a key principle to remember. Okay. Secondly, it's not the so absolute size of these margins. It's the relative size relative to the propensity to bring in more land. What is your propensity to increase yields? So those are two key principles out of this. I just want to illustrate this with a study we did a number of years ago um, um, for the integrated assessment community. Um, if you look at, um, <coughs> and I'll show you in a little bit, uh, land use change over the last half century, um, cropland change in the aggregate, so that's net change, uh, not gross change, it was relatively modest um, compared to the yield growth. So the extensive margin was relatively modest relative to the intensive margin of crop production increase. Yet, many of these integrated assessment models are projecting huge land conversion over the next century. That was a puzzle to me. So we wrote this paper to try to resolve that puzzle. And what we did, and you'll see throughout this, mostly I look at history. I'm not looking at the future, I'm looking at history. So let's look at the period from 1961 to 2006. And in this case, we use a model, I'll show you some results from that further on, that does a pretty good job capturing this intensive and extensive margin of expansion over that period. It's called the simple model, a simplified international model of prices, land use, and the environment. And into that, we can build the assumptions that these IAMs are making, and they often ignore, in most of them uh, um, until recently, have ignored the demand response and the intensive margin of supply. So you recall from here, they're zeroing out this and this, so they're going to overstate land conversion. How much do they overstate it? So if you ran those models over history, and unfortunately they don't do it uh, by and large, but if you did, you would find that they generate two, three times too much land conversion over this historical period, and it's because they're omitting these responses. So ignoring the economic margins of response, this isn't just a trivial <coughs> buffering effect. This is a very large effect, and I think it can lead to very misleading uh, predictions, dire predictions about um, using up all our land to feed the world in, in 2050. That's unlikely to be the case. Um, when you build these in, there are other margins of adjustment. Okay, so that's the uh, one point that I just want to get out there. Um, many of you have heard me make that before, but I think it's worth making again. Now let's talk about trade. Um, so we think about the um, treated and the untreated region. Um, so simplest way to get to trade is to have two regions. Okay, and I'm going to initially assume, as I said, trade economist nirvana, fully integrated markets. Fully integrated markets means there's one price across the world. So initially, this is the world price, and it applies in the treated region and the untreated region. Something happens and the world price changes, it changes in both regions. So that's, and by the same amount, that's integrated markets. It's a great starting point, but as we'll see later on, uh, it's not the way the world works, and I don't need to tell you guys that. You understand that well. So we've got panel A is the treated region. Panel B is the untreated region. So nothing's happening here. They've got a supply of crops uh, that doesn't change. Uh, that curve doesn't change. But what happens when you do something in the treated region that's large enough to affect the world price, to affect world markets, this region responds. And if it, as in this case, it's an improvement in agricultural technology, um, prices fall, and we know the rest of the world is going to reduce its production, reduce its land use. Uh, that's very clear. In the middle, we have the global equilibrium, and um, this is the world demand. We don't need to worry about demand in the treated and untreated region. If markets are perfect like this, there's just one global bathtub, and that's what this reflects. This reflects the shift in, in world supply and why price falls. So the puzzle in this case is what happens to land use in the treated region. Um, 
And uh, it's not clear because they're increasing production, but they're also becoming more efficient. So you could increase production and reduce land use. Why not? Or you could increase production and increase land use. It depends. What does it depend on? There's a sufficient statistic here which relates to the slope of this demand curve, okay? And that's, we call that, uh, the, sh the slope of that, the um, excess demand elasticity facing the treated region. And that's a composite of the global demand, okay? And the slope of this depends on whether it's a luxury or a staple good. But it also involves the supply in the rest of the world. So I've read, in some of your papers, I hear people saying, well, uh, what happens to land conversion here really depends on whether this is a luxury good or a staple good. That's not the case here. You could zero this out, and this still has slope to it because it depends on what happens in the rest of the world. This is why it's an excess demand curve, okay? You need to worry about supply response in the rest of the world as well as the demand. So we can zero this out, but it still depends on how big this is and how large the treated region is. Because as the treated region gets smaller and smaller and becomes just one farm, this becomes infinite. You don't affect world markets in some sense the price is given. So those are the key things in thinking about whether land use will expand because the steeper the slope, the more likely it is that land um, use will expand in the treated region. So um, on the other hand, as the treated region becomes the world, alpha becomes one and then it really is just the slope of this dem world demand schedule. But in general, for the problems you're thinking about, the biggest thing you need to be worried about is this supply in the rest of the world, not the demand. Um, just a few insights um, uh, in this case, and uh, this is from um, this question about, so agricultural technology, immediately you think of green revolutions, and you think of this question, are green revolutions land sparing? And this got a lot of action in PNAS over the last decade. Um, and uh, here's a paper, results from a paper, for example, by Nelson and colleagues on uh, using the GTAP framework to look at whether removing the green revolution uh, had a significant impact on cropland, and it does. Um, in fact, they find it was uh, land sparing. I'm just showing you here a result from the simple model uh, that illustrates a further point, and that is really to understand this, to answer this question, really we should rerun all of history. Okay, so let's go back to this 1961 to 2006 period. Let's run this simple model. This is observed change. As I remember, I said there was a huge increase in output, a tripling of crop output over this period. Most of it came from yield, not much from, um, not much from area. So you put these two together and you get about 15% increase in area. So a modest increase in area on net, 15%, a 300% increase in output, that's dramatic. Um, so that's blue is observed, green is what the simple model produces, so it doesn't reproduce history exactly, it's simple, but it comes close, especially partitioning the extensive, the intensive and extensive margins. So now we've got a lab environment in which we can explore this green revolution, we can take it away, okay? Take away the green revolution, rerun history, okay? That's the counterfactual. Take away the Green Revolution, rerun history, okay, output's much smaller in the Green Revolution period. This is a growth in percent terms. Yield growth is much smaller. Areas larger, areas larger in the rest of the world, areas larger across the board. It, um, taking away the Green Revolution requires more land, so the Green Revolution was land sparing, okay? So that, that's that issue. Now I want to uh, um, <coughs> um, deviate from that. I want to look forward. An African Green Revolution, you would think, well, um, everywhere else experienced a Green Revolution. If we did it in Africa, we get the same result. That isn't necessarily the case. <clears throat> if you assume integrated markets, so go back to that three-panel diagram, integrated markets, and you do the same experiment going forward, starting the Green Revolution in 2025, going out to 2050, actually, there's, there's no significant land sparing. You get expansion. Um, good things happen in agriculture, they expand in, in, in Africa, they expand area, the rest of the world contracts, and it's about a, a wash. So why would this green revolution be land sparing historically, but not in the future for Africa? Well, you can, with some simplifying assumptions, you can derive a result that's critical to this. Um, 
the condition for um, Jevon's paradox, or the condition for um, the, 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 the Green Revolution in Africa to actually be land using rather than land sparing, is that, um, that this condition applies. So it does relate to the global demand elasticity for, uh, for commodities, but it depends critically on relative yields. And you can see that if yields, yields in Africa, it's hard to see here, but all of you are familiar with this kind of result, the yield gaps. Africa yields are very, very low compared to the rest of the world, even when you, when you control for climatic and soil factors. So this is very small, and that means that the region where you're innovating, the region where you're expanding agriculture has very low yields. So you've got to expand a lot there <laughs> relative to um, uh, the rest of the world. And uh, maybe it's not surprising that this would lead to um, a, a global increase in land use. And it's even more striking if you look at terrestrial carbon in this case. So the, the relative productivity or the relative emissions efficiency in the case of terrestrial carbon is critical here uh, between the treated region and the untreated region. And this would come uh, in other areas, biodiversity, other metrics, this would shake out as well. The key thing is, what is the relative productivity in the treated region and the non-treated region? So, now, um, the world isn't, doesn't have integrated markets, doesn't have fully integrated markets. We know that. We know Africa, in many parts of Africa, um, they aren't well tied into world markets. And if we put that in there, the segmented markets, uh, this green revolution, future green revolution does become land sparing. So, the future... Uh, as we look to the future, this question of segmentation versus integration is critical. It determines whether or not this green revolution is land sparing or not. So we need to worry more about this market segmentation. I, that's my third point. I want to talk about, um, about market segmentation. So what is market segmentation? Market segmentation means you have limited access to world markets. Um, because in the bathtub model, doesn't matter whether you take it out here or there, put it in here or there, everyone sees it. You're fully integrated. But in a segmented market, in a world of segmented markets, um, as is the case, of course, in much of Africa, um, um, producers can't sell into the international market. They're very disconnected. Maybe they're only really consuming it themselves, their own consumption. Um, <clears throat> they may be very disconnected from markets and uh, producers, produ both producers and consumers. This is just a, um, a simple diagram illustrating this point in a crude way. These are shares of, of um, <coughs> participation in the global crops market um, at a national level. This is Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, this is how much they sell of their crops um, into um, international markets and how much they buy from international markets. Now contrast that with Europe. Okay. So Europe is much more integrated into international markets. Um, as a result, has a much larger transmission of international prices into domestic markets, or vice versa. And um, that's an important factor when we, when we consider this. So uh, market segmentation is important. We saw that in the previous diagram. I want to illustrate that in another way. Let's look over history from 1961 to 2006 again. Rerun this historical period again. And um, look at the various regions of the world, but I've just focused on Sub-Saharan Africa here. This is with the s historically segmented markets. This is rerunning history if world markets have been integrated over this period. The open circles are increase in crop output. So crop output, um, um, global crop output um, in Sub-Saharan Africa um, um, and, and, and these are the drivers of, of, of crop output, okay? So it could be your pro productivity on the supply side, income and population on the demand side. This bar is entirely red, and that says that unlike China, where a lot of the, in, uh, a lot of the, the crop production growth was from income driven, in Africa, income wasn't growing. Productivity was barely changing over this period. Most of the uh, production growth was driven by population. So more people, you need more food. <laughs> That's not surprising for anyone who's worked uh, in Africa over the last uh, decades. It's really mostly population growth driving the production. In a world of integrated markets, that would have been quite different. Some of China's income growth would have driven uh, production growth in Africa. And 
actually their product, low productivity would have been a drag on production. So um, in a world that's flat, an integrated markets world is flat. There's that one world price. Productivity is everything. If you fall behind a little bit, you lose market share. Okay, And that's what happens here. This is a drag on production. Sub-Saharan Africa actually would have had less crop production um, in an integrated markets world. Producers in Africa are protected to some extent by this, in, um, by this insulation. So, I mean, there are two ways to view it. If they're integrated in the world market and you gain productivity, that's an opportunity. But if you can't boost your productivity, you're, um, you would be uh, hurt by this competition because productivity growth in Africa was much slower than the rest of the world. Um, and this just compares for the simple model over this historical period for segmented markets, uh, predicted production growth versus actual. And you can see in Africa, uh, the model predicts less th uh, production growth than actually occurred, although it comes close. But um, if you had integrated markets, this bar would be back here. It's simply not possible to explain production growth in Africa with a world of integrated markets because their productivity growth um, was exerting such a drag. So integrated markets would give a very different pattern of global production given the historical patterns of productivity growth. I want to make one other point about um, uh, market segmentation. I think that's very important. So I think, in a sense, most of us live in a world of segmented markets. We think about the world as, a seg as segmented markets. And that's why I think it's important um, to, to now and then take our, put up our heads and think about what would the world look like in integrated markets? Because through the supply chains um, uh, out there, every time a railroad is built in further into Africa, every time the ports are improved, the customs are reformed, they're becoming more integrated. We're moving towards a, market of a world of integrated markets. We need to think about what that means. One thing, one area in which that has a dramatic impact is that of post-harvest loss uh, reduction. So this is something the Gates Foundation is heavily invested in. I happen to know about this because Purdue's been heavily involved in this, averting post-harvest losses. Well, what does this mean? This means that essentially you harvest the same amount of product, but more is available for consumption because you seal it's in hermetically sealed bags, for example. So when you open that bag, rather than half of it being destroyed, you have that crop to eat. So this makes more available on the market in a world of segmented markets as Gates hopes, this means lower prices. This means reduced um, <coughs> non-farm undernutrition. And very little land use change. Why? Because um, they're consuming more, but they're, um, they're, you're, um, <laughs> you're avoiding these losses. And so um, you don't need any more land. And no terrestrial carbon losses. Now, think about a world of integrated markets. Now there's this world market there, you're fully integrated. There is little impact on price, therefore little benefit for, for, for non-farm under nutrition, very, very little reduction, but a lot of land conversion, a lot of terrestrial carbon emissions. So um, this thinking about, thinking forward, if we're looking ahead decades, we need to be thinking about the possibility that markets will be more integrated and that could have a big impact that could change our view of some of these policies and their impact. Okay, so that's market uh, uh, That's market segmentation. Now I want to get to um, uh, Nelson's work on geography of world trade briefly. I think he's going to talk more about that later on. Um, <coughs> early on in the trade uh, in field, uh, <coughs> people thought of mostly in terms of these um, integrated markets, and in the, in the integrated market, the geography of trades not so important. Uh, Paul Armington in 1969 published a paper, uh, the IMF Working Paper Series, a very influential paper where he pointed out that the world doesn't work that way. When um, Toyota raises its price um, by um, you know $100, they don't just lose all their market share. They have a lot of loyal customers. Um, when uh, the US experiences, um, or, or maybe Mozambique experiences a drought, <laughs> Um, they don't, um, <coughs> um, they aren't wiped out of the market altogether. There is, a, um, there is some rigidity in these trade flows. And so he proposed a theory of demand distinct, uh, products distinguished by place. So, I mean, wine is the classic example. 
you have French wine, you have Australian wine, you have Chilean wine. People don't, uh, a, a slight increase in one price doesn't lead them to switch entirely. In fact, they might want to consume a portfolio of things. Um, you have these other kinds of ties that also result you know, think about the ties between Africa and their colonial, formal po colonial powers in, in Europe. A lot of trade rigidity there, and there's the Toyota phenomenon as well. So all of the models now of empirical trade have some kind of product differentiation, have some rigidity in trade flows. If these trade flows are rigid, then you need to understand that pattern, and you need to, to understand how that interacts with land use change. And that's what this paper uh, that... Um, Nelson and I published in 2011 really highlights that point. So um, this is looking at the effect. This was in the middle of the, um, the biofuels controversy, okay? And uh, the US EPA was asking us um, um, for more precision about our more uh, a precision about our estimates of global land use change. And, and I said, if we want to understand that, we need to think about the um, this trade structure. Um, the main competing, uh, we were doing some work, the main competing work uh, being done at the time was assuming integrated world markets, okay? So it's essentially this perfect market world. So we looked at the impact based on a, uh, an econometric model that Nelson estimated, impact of a perturbation in the U.S. that uh, led to a 15% rise in crop prices in the U.S., uh, this is actually about what happened in the early 90s as a result of an excessively wet year, less production. We were looking at coarse grains, corn in particular, less production in the U.S. meant higher price in the U.S. How does that transmit to land use across the world? And you can see under the Armington model, it kind of makes sense that the biggest country that's affected is Canada. We have a huge border with Canada. We trade a lot with Canada. They're a very important trading partner and they're most affected under a world of geography. The Papri guys were talking a lot about land use change in places like India that are big coarse grains producers. Um, this is the integrated world markets model and some error bars around those estimates. Does that really make sense? India is very closed economy when it comes to agriculture. The US doesn't trade much with it. The Armington model says, no, 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 that's much less important uh, than some of these other countries. So the, um, does this make a difference at all? Um, well, it turns out it does. Nelson calculated uh, the impact of this differential pattern of land conversion, how that interacts with uh, uh, terrestrial carbon intensities, and using the Armington model in this cap case happens to cut in half the emissions, greenhouse gas emissions from land use change. So trade is really important. That's a, that's a big factor. A factor of two is really big, and it's all about who you trade with, who's affected by a development in the treated region, okay? So I'm gonna conclude now um, with um, uh, a little discussion of general equilibrium constraints. So uh, this is kind of harking back to my previous life uh, with GPAP and the, and the general equilibrium world. And I want to emphasize three points that I think people in this room generally probably don't think about in their land use modeling. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, correct me if I am. And that is what's happening in the rest of the economy. What's happening to productivity growth in the rest of the economy, the non-land-based economy. The second point has to do, the next second two have to do with equilibrium conditions, factor market clearing and balance of payments equilibrium. And I'll talk about why those are important now. And I'm thinking about China, and the illustration I'm gonna give you is this kind of telecoupling between China and Brazil. Okay? And I wanna know, how important are the macro forces, the general equilibrium forces in that context? So to start with productivity growth, what happened in China over the last couple of decades? Very rapid productivity growth in the manufacturing sector, okay? And um, uh, even in some of the food processing sectors and, and um, very dramatic growth there. And that has shifted their comparative advantage I mean, China is still the lar world's largest agricultural producer, but their comparative advantage has shifted towards manufacturing. That means they're going to tend to export more manufacturers and import more of other stuff, like soybeans, for example, something where they don't have a comparative advantage. So strong productivity growth in the rest of the economy clearly was a driver of uh, some of this increased soybean um, trade. We want to look at that uh, quantitatively in a moment. The other thing, uh, the next thing that was happening was that um, 
a huge savings rate, so a lot of capital accumulation. Okay, a little bit of that spilled out overseas. It feels like a lot, but actually most of that savings was invested domestically. Tremendously cheap loans from the state banks to, um, and who do they loan to? Not to agriculture. Agriculture is not very capital intensive. You couldn't possibly get rid of all that money in agriculture. You're, you're, you're investing in the capital intensive sectors. Again, manufacturing. It's another boost to manufacturing. So what happens is you boost manufacturing, you pull labor out of agriculture, you re pull resources out of agriculture, and um, as a result, China's been desperately trying to boost agriculture with subsidies now. Um, and, uh, but that was another factor, a general equilibrium factor, drawing resources out of agriculture, reducing um, and, and encouraging imports of agricultural products. And finally, the basic balance of payments equilibrium condition, um, <coughs> Keeping capital inflows constant, or outflows, if you export more, you have to import more, okay? And even though the capital account changed in, in China, um, they had a surge in exports, was accompanied by a surge in imports, so you're just generally importing a lot more stuff. What are you gonna import? You're gonna import the stuff where you're losing comparative advantage. How important are those? Well, here we've looked at this historical period, 2004 to 2011, a period over in which Brazil overtook the U.S. as the most important exporter, soybeans to China and worldwide. Uh, total imports in China over this short period rose by more than 150%. The imports of soybeans from Brazil, uh, well over 200%, and from the U.S. more modest growth. Um, so what were the drivers behind that? <clears throat> so um, these are the total changes. Um, the bars here are the grand total changes. So this is 150%. This, this down here is maybe 125%. Um, I've decomposed those. We've decomposed those both by region, what region was driving it, and by factor. So it's kind of a two-way decomposition. It's a little complicated. So I'm going to pause here for a minute just so you can follow it. Um, <clears throat> anything that's blue relates to Brazil. Anything that's red relates to China. So over here you can see that the biggest thing driving China's imports was China's economy. That kind of makes sense, okay? What part of China's economy, okay? They were protecting soybeans over this period, and you can see policy, um, policy in China did boost, um, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, policy in China. Well, they were a couple, doing a couple of things in China. I'll get to that. I'll get to that in a moment. But anyway, wasn't wasn't playing a big role. Policy in China wasn't playing a big role on that. Um, and, and soybean productivity in in Brazil. Anything that's blue is Brazil. Soybean productivity in Brazil did contribute strongly to Brazil's exports, but didn't play a big role overall. The dominant thing overall is this macroeconomic force, okay? These, precisely these considerations that we're, a lot of us are ignoring in our partial equilibrium land use predictions. So would the partial equilibrium models have predicted this dramatic increase in soybeans? I think not, um, particularly not the overall increase in soybean imports. Um, and um, so this is the dominant factor in this particular telecoupling. Um, it's less the case when we go to um, land, uh, cropland expansion in Brazil, which expanded by almost 12% over this period, that's the bar here, and this is the decomposition of the different drivers by region. Most of the things driving cropland expansion in Brazil were happening in Brazil. Um, China was contributing to that, but if you took away China, um, <coughs> um, a difficult thought experiment, but if you took away China, uh, according to this, you would still have um, uh, land use expansion, and that's come because of this productivity growth in the crop sectors. But macroeconomics in Brazil was actually working in the opposite direction. So it was reason why China, China is more dominant here is that um, economic growth. Uh, we had a boom in Brazil during part of this period, and um, and that drew was actually the thing. Developments of the rest of the economy were drawing some resources out of agriculture. So the macroeconomics can be um, quite important and we shouldn't ignore those. So I've got to wrap up here. Here are my closing statements to the jury. <laughs> okay, just in case you missed it. Um, you ignore the economic margins at your peril and if you do, you're gonna overstate uh, cropland changes. 
<clears throat> ignoring supply response in the rest of the world is going to not only lead to erroneous conclusions, but it's probably biasing your results against Jevons' paradox. Market segmentation um, is, um, <clears throat> again, inaccurate predictions of land use change. Um, actually, um, market segmentation, because it makes this excess demand elasticity smaller, um, biases against, um, 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 well, ignoring it biases in favor of Jevons' paradox, including it by, um, um, it makes it less likely you'll accept that. The geography of trade is critical, but the is precise empirics depend on the particular pattern of um, trade um, in, um, in the treated, with the, between the treated region and the rest of the world and how that interacts with intensities, whether it's biodiversity intensity, carbon intensity, yield intensity. And then ignoring these GE constraints, I think in some cases could lead to, in, in the China's case, China soy imports, a real understatement of trade growth um, if we had done this experiment beforehand or if, if we rerun this without those considerations. So that's the wrap up. There's a few selected references on the slides and here are my buddies on <laughs> this work. Um, I'll wrap up now.